For billions of years, it had been orbiting the sun at the dark edge of the solar system, in a frozen realm populated only by icy debris. Perhaps tens of thousands of years ago, no one knows when, a close encounter altered the course of this small chunk of ice and flung it toward a new destiny and a new orbit that would bring it close to the sun every few thousand years. On its most recent passage around the sun, a team of astronomy enthusiasts awaited this comet's arrival with ambitious plans, a project to capture a comet on film as no one had done before. The project was the rather wild idea of Peter Saravolo, a Canadian astronomy enthusiast and telescope maker. The goal? To make a comet come alive. Back in the 1980s, I saw an IMAX movie called Sacred Sight. It wasn't a very long movie, only about seven minutes, full of time-lapse motion picture sequences, some with astronomical themes. And one of the, one of the segments in that, a 20-second clip, was of Comet Halley moving through the star field. To the layman, it didn't look very impressive, but to someone who understands astronomical photography, I was stunned. For the first time, I saw an object like a comet come to life, as opposed to being a static, two-dimensional thing on a photograph. And that tr proved to be a real inspiration. The opportunity to capture a comet in time-lapse movies came in March 1996, and the close approach of Comet Hyakutake a comet discovered only weeks earlier by Yuji Hyakutake, a Japanese amateur astronomer. Hyakutake's comet, like most, is really an orbiting iceberg. A nucleus only two kilometers across, pockmarked with jets of dust and gas that erupt into activity as the comet nears the warmth of the sun. Capturing this activity in time-lapse detail was going to be a technical challenge. No conventional camera or movie system would do the job. Instead, Peter had to draw on his optical expertise to design a special photographic system called an astrograph. The astrograph is a completely custom-designed uh, photographic telescope. Nothing about it is off the shelf, if you will, or readily available. Everything from the optics um, I designed and manufactured right through to the, the film holder, holding the film in place. Uh, the design is uh, rather experimental, and when it was built, I wasn't sure how well it would work. As it turns out, it works rather well. It works rather well for still photography. How it's going to work for motion picture photography uh, is going to be another story, and we'll find out. The astrograph's hybrid optics work like a fast telephoto lens, but equally important to the project was what the lens was mounted on. The telescope gear is mounted on a device called an equatorial mount. It's basically two axes at right angles to each other, driven by motors, which allow the telescope to track the stars in this fashion. And this tracking is very important because it gives us, uh, it allows us to you know, follow the stars and build up light on the, um, on the film so we get a brighter image as the time goes by. The, uh, the tracking is never perfect, however, and part of the, the whole assembly, which is very important, is the guide telescope along with uh, what's called a CCD auto guider. This electronic device locks onto a star, for example, and makes sure that the, the equatorial mount is tracking precisely with it. And if it doesn't, it applies correction so that you know, it stays locked on the star, giving you the tightest possible star image on the film. Most photographs of astronomical wonders require exposures of minutes, even hours. If a photographer takes just three or four good exposures a night, 
it's considered a success. But time-lapse movies of the comet would require taking dozens of exposures every night for as many nights as possible. The result would be hundreds of negatives. But it became clear to me after not too long a time that turning those little frames, 35 millimeter frames, into a motion picture was going to be one heck of a lot of work and it required a skill set different than my own. And that's when I I did my best to try and convince Doug George that he really needed to be in on this project. His programming skills, his image processing skills were indispensable in turning these still frames into a truly stunning motion picture sequence. But Peter realized he needed more than just Doug's expertise. Since Comet Yakutake was coming so close to us, I suspected it might be possible to resolve jet-like structure coming from the comet. And I suggested to Paul Boltwood that it might be a worthy project to try and produce a time-lapse motion picture of the inner workings of Comet Yakutake, trying to record the jet structure and changing features very tight into the comet's head. And we were very fortunate that he took, he took the project on. Doing astronomical photography in the field, especially far off, way off places, um, a mountaintop, for example, is always a bit tricky. You never know what can possibly happen, and so you want to be prepared. And doing it alone is never advisable. I was, so I was really fortunate that uh, Glenn LeJoux decided to join me on this little uh, adventure. Uh, I've only been doing astrophotography now for less than a year, and uh, I'm not all that experienced with the, with the process. But Glenn, of course, he's been doing it for many, many years and has a lot of experience under his belt, a lot of trips under his belt, and uh, he was a welcome addition to the trip. Glenn was no stranger to shooting the night sky. On trips to Australia, for example, he had captured time-lapse sequences showing the Milky Way rotating around the celestial pole, clearly illustrating one of the challenges of night sky photography. In astronomical photography, tracking the object you're photographing is very important because it's moving across the sky. And, you, and typically we use exposures on the order of minutes as opposed to seconds because uh, we need enough light to build up on the film to register uh, a significant image. In this case, we're actually going to be tracking the comet and not the stars uh, as this telescope was designed, as this telescope hardware was designed to do. So consequently, the guide telescope is going to be locked onto the comet's um, head and tracking it, because it's moving independently of the stars. I hope it'll work. If it doesn't, we need to have a backup system. And that's where Doug came in. As the comet approached, he spent hurried hours writing a computer program that would track the comet automatically, even if the main guide system failed. At least that was the plan. Six degrees, 20 minutes, seven arc seconds. And it's not even close. Not even close. Well. What we're doing here is uh, putting together a backup drive system in the event that the automatic tracker on the guide telescope fails to lock on the comet for the, for the likely reason that it's the, uh, the comet is just too fuzzy on the inside and there's nothing firm for it to lock onto. And uh, Doug is writing a piece of software to run off a laptop computer in the field <coughs> and the, the computer will basically <coughs> command the stepper motors to step move in a certain direction so that we can pan with the comet as it's moving through the sky. And it's important that we be able to do that because we want to pan with it smoothly so we can generate a smooth motion picture sequence. And uh, it's clear tonight and we're a week away from departure. Uh, the time is running short and uh, are we going to be able to take advantage of this clear Don't worry. Test Don't it worry. in the real world? Uh, yeah, we can test it. Uh, I just have to start out something. Give me a little time to think about it. But the comet was approaching fast and time was running out. Paul Boltwood had his own technical challenges, tracking the comet from his backyard observatory. Paul planned to use a 7-inch refractor telescope to image the comet at extremely high magnification. But instead of using film, Paul planned to capture the comet electronically using a sophisticated device he built himself. This CCD camera would record images of the comet directly onto a computer. In addition, 
Paul, too, wrote custom software that would allow his telescope to follow the fast-moving comet. In early March, he tested the system. We've now tested this software, and we've taken some images. One of the images is on the screen here. This was done in a fairly low magnification and a fairly long exposure. The hope was to show some detail in the tail uh, fairly close in, but there, there isn't very much detail there. And so a decision has been taken to go for a higher magnification and concentrate on the dust jet activity near the nucleus. Paul's project would complement the images the rest of the group hoped to take. Paul concentrating on details near the nucleus and Peter taking wider shots of changes in the tail. It had taken a few furious weeks of planning, but the Canadian group was ready. Equipment was checked and waiting to track the comet across the sky. Everything was set. Well, except for one small detail. Well guys, that's well and good, but we've had terrible weather here the last few months, and if I know the area. We're just going to have more of the same for the next while. And I think if you want to get a good run of night after night of comet images to make up a sequence, I don't think you're going to get it here. Well, you're, you're talking about heading back to the southwest. Oh, you're not serious. We just came back from Arizona. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, think about it. I mean, first of all, the comet's better positioned up here, uh, up here than it is down there. It'll look great behind a wall of cloud, yeah. Okay, but you might get down there, the comet might not perform. Okay, mm -hmm. you, the equipment might not work. We're already spending a bucket of money. I mean, going down there is going to be very expensive. I mean, mm -hmm. Instead of being a picture of a comet's tail and a piece of film, you might just come back with your own tail between your legs. <laughs> Flight attendants, prepare for landing. It was to be a real comet odyssey. The project needed clear skies, consistently clear skies, night after night, as the comet swept across the northern sky in late March. Comet Hiagkutake would pass only 15 million kilometers above Earth's North Pole, then race off toward the Sun. The group would have only a few days to shoot the comet, one chance in a lifetime. Their destination, Tucson, Arizona, the location of astronomical observatories and a mecca for astronomers seeking clear skies. Meeting Peter and Glenn was Dean Kettleson, an amateur astronomer Peter had known for many years. Dean was instrumental in the logistics for the Comet Odyssey. Just carting the hundreds of pounds of photo and telescope gear across the continent, then out to the final observing site, was no small task. Dean provided the needed transportation on the ground, and a knowledge of the best local sites for photographing the night sky. His choice was a mountaintop in southeastern Arizona, near the town of Wilcox. Well, we're heading out to Chiricahua National Monument. It's on the north side of the Chiricahua Mountains. They peak up to 10,000 feet high, but Massai Point, where we're going, is about 7,000 feet high. The thing it's got going for it is that uh, 7,000 feet altitude, uh, close enough to Tucson, about a two, two and a half hour drive from Tucson. You're close to the amenities of a big town. Uh, we're 30 miles away from Wilcox, a sleepy little ranching town where Motel 6 is. Uh, paved road to the site, a nice large parking lot where uh, we can put up lots of equipment. and. Uh, far away from any lights, that's the important thing. The volcanic rock formations attract most visitors to the Chiricahuas. But for Peter and Glenn, the attraction was a parking lot at 7,000 feet altitude far from city lights. This is where they would set up their gear every evening for the next week or more. As any astrophotographer knows, it's a meticulous process. Equipment has to be aligned with arc second accuracy. In the dark, in the cold, late at night, it's easy to make mistakes.
Would the equipment all work? An essential component was the automatic guider. Would it track the comet as planned? Or fail to lock on? Would the photographs of the comet be sharp or unusably blurred? Dawn, and what would become a familiar chore? Taking down all the equipment they had so painstakingly set up hours before. It had been a successful first night, or had it? The real proof was still in the cameras waiting to be developed. We've got lots of rolls for you. The moment of truth. Had the guider worked? Indeed, had the comet performed? Well, the comet's working really well. It's doing its job. Look at all those streamers and that. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. But I can tell by looking at this print, when you look at it critically, that uh, not all the stars are in focus right here around the comet's head. They're a bit blobby. Oh, yeah, I can see that. Yeah, and out here they're nice and sharp. Even over here they're nice and sharp. The, the cameras, the film holders, are supposed to take care of that, but we're having a problem with it. I'm not, I'm not quite understanding what, what's going on. The, um, the film is pressed against um, a platen, uh, this piece of aluminum right here. When the, camera, when the film is loaded in the camera, we basically close it up like that, and by rotating a knob, we can, we can drop this pressure plate onto the film, and the, uh, uh, the vacuum pump will basically suck air through there and suck the film flat. And you can see there's a hose. I've got film loaded in this camera. And the hose is running out to the uh, vacuum pump, which in this case is um, a breast pump, amazingly enough. Uh, the breast pump was, uh, turned out to be uh, an excellent solution to the problem because in the field, you don't want anything that's huge. It has to be really compact. And, uh, uh, and it works. It works amazingly well. Now, I could have repackaged this so that the uh, put it in an aluminum case or something, make it look very official, but uh, it makes a great conversation piece. <laughs> but the, the way it works, basically, I'm opening up the, the camera here to have a look at the thing, and I can look at the reflection to see if it's flat or not. And right now, without the, uh, the platen engaged, it's definitely not flat. So I'm going to drop the platen, helps a bit, and then activate the breast pump. You can hear the, uh, the whining there, the humming. And it seems to be sucking the film flat. And I'm not 100% sure why I should be doing this. I think there's probably one area over there where that's not as flat as it should be. But uh, I got a feeling that uh, part of the problem here isn't just the film buckling. Um, I think it's also collimation in the telescope is not 100%. Well, for the amount of defocus, I don't know, it doesn't look too bad to me right now. And I yeah. think by the time you do a transfer through digitizing and onto videotape, you know, TV resolution just won't show that amount at all. Really? No, that won't be a problem for, for the videotape. Well, it's a, it's a godsend. The first night had been successful, so it was back to Chiricahua, back to the routine of setting up. a long night under the Arizona sky. They hoped to photograph the comet every four minutes for 10 hours a night for as many nights as they could. So far, so good, and uh, everything seems to be working well. Uh, we'll see what happens uh, further on. Now the question turned to the weather. With the clear skies during the days, 
cold through the long desert nights. Yes, this was Arizona, but it was also mountain country, notorious anywhere for changeable weather. Well, I mean, it, it, this wasn't shrouded in cloud before. Hey, look, if you don't like the weather, Glenn, just wait two seconds. Detail visible tonight is phenomenal. The, the you got the the head of the comet. You have all these rays extending off it. This is amazing. And this is with a pair of three-inch binoculars. What is it, 70 millimeter binoculars? Is, is there a reason why we didn't bring a telescope down to actually look through other than binoculars? We've been at it now for about. Uh, about four or five days now, and uh, discovered that after an all-night astrophotography session, I'm just, you know, basically thoroughly wiped out, and uh, I, I tend to fall asleep on the way back to the motel at Wilcox. So we worked it out that I drive up in the evenings, and uh, Glenn, he drives down in the mornings. Hi, right, remember us? Yes. Is that still good? It was an arduous schedule. Each night would yield only seconds of time-lapse footage. Today was one of those hectic days where we slept all morning as much as we could after being up all night shooting, and then upon waking, racing off to Tucson to get some film developed. I got about 10 rolls, and Glenn has a couple of rolls of uh, slide to do. We have to do it at least every other day because we're kind of worried that the equipment may be, something may be going wrong and it may not be apparent in the actual operation, but we want to catch it before we lose too much time. And so we race into town to get the film processed. It's kind of grueling, it's tough uh, because you're spending a lot of time on the road and, and then you're being up all night after getting only about four hours sleep, but it's what it takes to get the job done right. Well, another great day in the Chiricahua Mountains. We're experiencing a significant amount of wind, and it's probably going to cause us some grief uh, with vibration in the instruments. You know, I don't know. Is your mount going to hold up? Well, probably so-so. I might set up in the, the lee of the van or something tonight. No, I'm, sure <laughs> I'm, I'm setting up in the lee of the van. <laughs> well, I'll be in the lee of you. <laughs> The wind has died down somewhat, but it's still an issue. I, um, I managed to set up in the lee side of uh, this uh, rock and uh, tree, these trees here, but um, it's not going to be enough. So I'm, what I'm, I think what I have to do is uh, move the van just behind the telescope to provide a bit of a windbreak so that uh, it doesn't jiggle the, uh, the telescope too much. The problem is, is that if, the, if there's a lot of vibration caused by wind, buffeting, it's going to jostle the telescope and the, and the automatic tracker is going to lose the lock on the comet and, I won't, and I'll have trouble tracking it across the sky. I've been having a lot of trouble getting to sleep. I've been, I've been what, sleeping about, what, four hours? I think this morning I slept about four hours and uh, just starting to, I think all these uh, nights of four hour sleep are starting to pile up. But I just thank God for your t-shirt because right now it's keeping me going. <laughs> oh, God. Cheap court. This will help me sleep in the morning. The weather held for over a week, a long sleepless week, but their luck was about to change. This looks pretty bleak. Yeah, it's almost overcast. The sun's getting low. I what, don't think we can go anywhere else. What, uh, what's the chance of... Uh, well, there's, always a, there's always a chance of uh, clearing. You never know. Well, I, I uh, can't afford to even miss the potential of even a clear night. I need all the footage that I can get, all the frames. Besides, I didn't spend thousands of dollars to come down here and sleep in a motel anyway. Um, okay, I guess we should stay then. This cloud is hanging over our head. 
Yeah, but we had it like that before a couple times in the last few nights, and it's gotten better. I think it's going to do it again. I can see it's kind of clear to the west, and it just hasn't moved. What, t what time is it? Uh, yeah, it's almost 8 o'clock now. I think we should tear down head down the hill. It's going to be... Oh, the... let, let's stick it out. You're just going to waste too much time. If we pack everything up and go down, it'll be real late, and you'll just miss most of the night. Hi, Doug. Yeah, it's Peter. Not bad. It's all right. Other than last night, we had our first full night of cloud. Yeah, it was over graphic stuff. It formed over our head and wouldn't dissipate. And uh, we didn't we decided not to go down the hill right away. And and then we fell asleep in the van. And uh, and that was it. We were out. <laughs> we needed the rest, I guess. With the moon setting later each night, time for shooting the comet under a dark sky was coming to an end. They had captured the comet on 10 nights, taking over 900 photographs. But that was just the beginning. Nine hundred negatives of the comet, and each had to be digitally scanned. The technique is a new one, combining the 150-year-old process of photography with the latest digital technology. Each negative was placed on an electronic scanner, which turned the image into digital data. Each digitized image was then copied onto a compact disc called a photo CD. Certainly a handy way to store photographs, but the photo CDs would allow much more than that. Before they could be spliced into a movie, each image had to be enhanced, corrected, cleaned up. Doing this using a conventional photographic darkroom would have been nearly impossible. The amount of work required to touch up the hundreds of photos by hand would have taken months, years. So what we did, instead of using a darkroom to try and assemble the movie, was to take photo CD technology and apply that to the job, transferring all the images onto a computer disk and loading it up on the computer so we can use software to process the images and build the movie. Sounds simple in theory, but... The computer image processing turned out to be a lot more work than any of us had ever thought. There were several problems. Uh, first of all, there was quite a few scratches in the frame because Peter was a little rough on the film at the telescope. And there was also dust specks that got onto some of the frames during the photo CD scanning. So I had to go through with a standard image processing package and manually edit out these scratches and dust specks using the mouse. After a day of editing nearly 100 frames to take out these scratches and such, my hand was aching. And I came to the realization that there was no way we were going to do the rest of the processing using an off-the-shelf package. I had to write some sort of special software package to batch process all the images at once. The next problem we encountered was that each individual frame seemed to have its own color balance. The background of the image would flicker in color and brightness from frame to frame. This turned out to be due to variations in sky conditions and also differences between individual rolls of film. The way we solved this was to have the computer look at the image in three color bands. Every image on a computer is composed of red, green, and blue images. And I looked at each one of those in turn and adjusted it so that the background was set to black. The net result was when these three colors were combined back together again, the background was a nice neutral black. The most obvious problem with the image sequence was the fact that the comet didn't stay put in the exact same spot in every frame like it would on a movie. It would roam around a bit or sometimes hop around from place to place on the frame. So I had to write an algorithm which would locate the head of the comet precisely and then move it so that each frame would have the comet in the exact same position. The last problem I have to deal with in making this movie is problems with video itself. One of the problems with video monitors is that they don't show very, very bright things and very, very dark things very well on the same screen together. The, and here is the comet. There's a nice bright area near the nucleus and then the tail itself is really washed out because it's exceedingly faint in comparison to the head of the comet. So what we would do is make a contrast adjustment and now we have a nice bright tail, 
but the head of the comet is totally burned out and is uh, not very not very nice. So what we decided to do was to do a, a technique called a nonlinear stretch, where we'd adjust the tail, the darker parts of the image, more than we adjust the head. And the net result of that is a nice pleasing appearance where the head of the comet and the tail of the comet both look good on the video at the same time. Paul also had his work cut out for him. Staying at home in Ontario had meant fighting the clouds Peter and Glenn had mostly avoided. Even so, on the nights the comet was closest to Earth, Paul had captured more than 2,000 digital images from his small backyard observatory. Yeah, I just uh, finished processing the images uh, from the comet encounter um, in order to see the fine detail that's in around the nucleus. The one on the right here is one of the images, and I'm quite excited to see just how good the jets are coming off the nucleus here. It's better than I expected. On the left here, we have the, uh, one of the original images. This one here has been derived from. And this is the way I saw it as I actually did the imaging. This is an image straight from the camera. And I could see that there was some detail in the tail, and there's some detail in the coma here. It was enough to make me proceed and do all the work that was involved here. Um, but this is better than I perhaps had expected. What remained was to turn all the still frames Doug and Paul had processed into motion pictures. Only then would they really see the results. Weeks of planning, nights of arduous shooting, and months of work at the computer came down to one short videotape. Did anybody bring any champagne? <laughs> Not me. That's it? That's it. That was the entire length? How many frames was that? 609. But there were almost eight, eight, almost 900 frames in that sequence. And about 200 of them were clouded out, or um, twilight, or very badly scratched. Wow. Short, yes, but rich in remarkable detail. No, th this first part, I like the first part, I have to admit, that first part looks really yeah. nice. You know, up, up, up until the night with the clouds, you know, is the best part. In there's a, a there's a galaxy. So that little galaxy zooming by. Oh yeah. Yeah. Going right. into the tail. You can see the cloud, bright stars. Yeah. Going through the clouds. Up, they fuzz up, and yes. then, then you see a little hop as I've deleted a number of frames that are too clouded out. Okay. So th that that big jump was because of the cloud, because you had to edit out yeah, the cloud. Yeah. It, it must have knocked out about uh, half the night, at least. Then comes the dust tail that I like because of the color contrast with the iron tail. Y you've got many different appearances. The different nights are all different from each other. We're very lucky on that. This comet really looks like many different comets. What are those things zooming by there like that? Satellites. It's got to be satellites. I thought the satellites. I thought they might have been a meteor or something that was straight through. No, there's too many of them. They're running parallel. They're yeah. satellites. They're probably geosynchronous satellites. Well, it's amazing the differences you the difference you get when this thing is set in motion. The brilliant head glows in shades of green and cyan, colors created by molecules of carbon and cyanogen. The most striking feature is the comet's bluish tail, a gas tail waving in the wind of charged particles and magnetic fields streaming out from the sun. As the comet approached Earth, its motion across the sky sped up, making stars appear to streak across the frame faster and faster. Partway through the sequence, a broad yellowish tail appears, one made of dust particles ejected from jets on the nucleus of the comet. I'm really sorry I didn't start earlier. Yeah. 
I'm really sorry I didn't continue. But we were spent. <laughs> yeah, here's Paul <laughs> sequence. Look at the jets. You can oh, rotate. What did you get the jets? Yeah, it's just spinning around. Look wow. at the stars zipping through. Looks like it's raining. What's that fountain effect? But what happened to the rotation? It doesn't look like it's actually rotating. It looks like it's just blowing stuff off. Uh, it's rotating in the first part. Yeah, yeah it's going and that, now here, here, it's going off. Going, going right off the screen. We got jets that go right off. The screen. Did you have? Did you have much cloud? But they're going this way now. Did you have much? Was there's a big, there's a big transition between here, this part that's rotating. Oh, there, there were. Uh, and then nights that bang there yeah. now, now the now the fountain. well the, the, there's a couple well, nights change a night that's more than one night though isn't it the oh, gap we've, we've got yes well, and get a lot of those features in the tail the three ones that just three seem nights to stick gap. right there you know with hardly any motion though that's pretty interesting that's weird i find that the uh um the stars can be a little distracting there's so many of them edit them out <laughs> <laughs> I don't just take it. a few out <laughs> Paul's high magnification view probes into the bright head of the comet to reveal details in a region roughly 14,000 kilometers across. The two kilometer wide nucleus itself is invisible, embedded in the bright glow, but spraying from the region around the nucleus are multiple jets of dust. Paul captured his sequence over three nights. On the first, the jets are smaller. But on the second night, the jets showed wonderful structure and motion. As they did again on night three. They had achieved their goal. A group of astronomy enthusiasts had combined talents and resources to bring a comet to life. The images are beautiful, almost hypnotic to gaze at. Reward enough for the effort? Perhaps, but in a surprising turn of events, the movies were to prove to have much more than just aesthetic value. Comets are streaking through the skies in Tucson, Arizona today. Well, at least the idea of comets is. We'll go there to find out why. Over the last several days, we've been taking you to Tucson, Arizona to hear the latest from the planetary meeting in the American Astronomical Society. Tonight, one last visit there, one last satellite interview with our very own Ivan Semenuk. So, what's the big news from the gathering today? Probably one of the most interesting things, kind of heartwarming for me, is uh, some Canadian astronomers, in fact, not professional astronomers, but hobbyists, uh, made a wonderful movie of Comet Hyakutake, probably the best Comet movie ever made. And they were invited to show that movie, that video, here uh, at the conference. And it's got all the professional astronomers raving and, and, uh, and talking about what kind of science can be learned from this wonderful piece of film. October 1996 and one of the world's largest gatherings of planetary astronomers. The movies are a hit, both for their science and their beauty. More interesting than any theoretical model I've ever seen. Ever the movies brought computer models to life. I'm sure there's a lot of great science in it, but I just think it's beautiful from an aesthetic point of view. The group had been invited to attend the conference by one of the world's leading comet experts, Steve Larson. Well, how's it going? I been getting all kinds of comments about your uh, video. Well, it went very well. We've had lots of people come and lots of people have uh, found it very interesting. A number of people have been Dozens of scientists requested digital copies of the movies and still frames for research on the nucleus and tail structure of Comet Hayakutake. From his office in Tucson, Steve Larson explains some of the science in the images. So, Steve, these are nice, pretty pictures here, but can you uh, Tell us what's going on in a very basic way with the comet and uh, what we're seeing, what's happening. Well, these time-lapse videos show graphically how comets change in time rather than still pictures. And uh, because they're color, they also show various components of the comet. You can see the head of the comet, which is gases produced by sublimating ices as it gets close to the sun and also components caused by dust 
which are blown back by radiation pressure, which are shown as kind of yellowish, and then uh, ions, which are purplish, that get driven back by the magnetic field of the solar wind. And uh, only in sequences like this can you really see the uh, subtle changes in the ions, which are traveling rather quickly. Uh, they're being accelerated back as uh, a couple hundreds of kilometers per second velocities, whereas uh, the other, uh, the dust, for example, is, is going back much uh, more slowly. For this comet, the gas tail was the showpiece. This purplish tail is made of ions, molecules of water and carbon monoxide, among others, stripped of some electrons. Like iron filings, these ions can be twisted into intricate patterns by magnetic fields. The waves and ripples we see are an effect of the comet traveling across the shifting magnetic field spiraling out from the sun. They form a visible probe of the space between the planets, a celestial windsock blowing in the solar wind. Then the sequence that shows the uh, near nucleus structure is particularly interesting because this component is the brightest part of the comet is all dust and uh, these are being given off from a rotating nucleus from discrete areas mm -hmm. and uh, so you almost get a long sprinkler effect uh, for these different uh, active areas as the nucleus rotates. On the first night there is a slight clockwise rotation but on the second night the jets appear to be shooting straight out. The pressure of sunlight curves the dust jets back in either direction, but with little rotation. As it turned out, on the nights Paul took his images, we were looking down at the equator of the comet. Had we been looking at either of its poles, the lawn sprinkler effect would have been more obvious. This sort of imaging sequence that we've seen here, um, has this been done before? Have we had the opportunity to do this sort of thing before? People have made attempts to do it. I've never seen it done so well. Um, the key here is being able to sit on it for a long period of time, and that's mm -hmm. not generally possible, either due to weather or telescope time or whatever. Uh, for the professional kind astronomer. Of, for professional in particular, we're yeah. trying a lot of different kinds of things. So this Yakutake provided us an excellent opportunity uh, because it was a, such a close approach. Yes. How often can we expect such <clears throat> close approach type comets to appear? Oh, once or twice a lifetime. That's it. Mm -hmm. That's that were it. this bright. All right. Hope, hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> After rounding the sun on May the 1st, 1996, Comet Hyakutake sped away. Returning back to the outer solar system. Its next visit? some 14,000 years from now. Comet Yakutake turned out to be the opportunity of a lifetime. Having a comet come by so close, one that was so dynamic, so active, and having the right mix of people, having the right equipment ready at the right time, was extremely fortunate. And then to have the results, the images, that went into making the, the movie turn out to have scientific value. Scientists have requested copies of the images for research purposes to study the nature of comets. All in all, it's been a truly rewarding experience. Mm -hmm.